Well, good afternoon to you. So I am an ethical hacker, which sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? But one of the good guys. So we go out there and we research the security of lots of vehicles. And one of the things that concerns me is we talk about autonomy, vehicles that can drive themselves, but yet we've seen and carried out hacks on even simple connected vehicles that really shouldn't be possible. I want to show you some examples of those and some of the crazy things we've found and seen. Now, to go back in time a little bit, you probably all remember the Jeep hack. That was, some, that was Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, who were an amazing bunch of guys. And what they discovered was that you could bridge the infotainment system and jump onto the vehicle network. And once you'd done that, you had control over various of the vehicle's functions, so the steering wheel, the throttle, the brakes, and that's really quite scary. But there's been more since then as well. So the Nissan Leaf is a little electric vehicle, awesome car, and a guy called Scott Helm and uh, another researcher called Troy Hunt discovered you could uh, actually track the vehicles in real time because they hadn't secured them properly. And then my favorite, Tesla. Anyone here got a Tesla? I have one on order. Awesome vehicles. I, I absolutely love the Tesla as a, as a vehicle. But even that, where they had a relatively clean sheet to start on relatively recently, so they weren't um, stuck with years of development that manufacturers had gone through previously. They didn't have legacy systems to worry about. Even they made some mistakes. And there's a wonderful video with some researchers from Cloudflare showed how you could run a, a, a rogue smartphone app and you could kill a Tesla as it drove past you. Awesome. That's scary. Now, the reason this happens is the attack surface has grown hugely on a vehicle. Back in the past, maybe there was um, a key. You could unlock your key with uh, radio frequency. Now we've seen it jump. We've got a massive attack surface to play with. We've got, um, we've got Wi-Fi, we've got Bluetooth, we've got tire pressure monitoring systems, we've got infotainment systems that pull data up and down from the internet. We see even web browsers in cars. And you're expanding the opportunity for the hacker hugely. Now, I want to go back initially. I want to talk about some um, electric vehicles. I love electric cars, I might add. Um, anyone here got a BMW i3? Or maybe if you're really lucky, an i8? Nobody? No, the i8 is a cool car. Uh, very quick, looks amazing. And here's an example of how security goes wrong. This was found by us a couple of years ago, and we discovered some problems with the smartphone app that you used to connect to the i-series cars. Now, I'm sure some of you with a BMW, you've used Connected Drive, the smartphone app. This is slightly different. It's called iRemote. And when you set it up, you go through a process with customer services. When they first started, you rang them, and they would help you create a username. And they would suggest it as your first name and your last name. Great, that means we know the format. So if I know your name, I know your username. The next place we went is we looked at the registration option. And if you put in and try and register a username that's already present, it goes, no, you can't have that. Ah, that means I know you've got an account on Connected Drive. Cool. The next place you go is now I know your username. It has a forgotten password function. So I go, OK, here's your username. I've forgotten my password. And it then sends an SMS message to your cell phone, which is five characters, or was five characters, and lowercase only. And that's not long enough. And we can now run a brute force attack against the login, and eventually, after a period of time, maybe half a day, we crack your password. Now I can log in to the app, and I have control of your car. So with that application, I can find your vehicle because it tells me on a map where your car is. So if you've lost it in a shopping mall, you can find your car. But now the hacker can find your car. And the next bit you can do, you can unlock the vehicle using the smartphone app. So now I'm inside your car. The next thing I do, I find the diagnostics port that is by the steering wheel. I plug in a coding mechanism, I create a key, I steal your car. That's crazy. That's been fixed a long time ago now, which is great. But I want to tell you now a little bit about how we hacked this. This is a Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Has anyone got one? I've got, I got lots. I like these ones. They're really cool cars. It's a plug-in hybrid. So it's electric. It's great. It can do about 40 kilometers range on electric batteries only. Then it has a, a gas engine that will go the rest. I love it. It's a really cool vehicle. Um, now, I wanted to look at how we could go about 
seeing what we could do. So the first thing we found was the smartphone application. And the smartphone application in this case is used to tell the car when to charge its batteries so it can charge cheaply overnight. It's used to set up a heating or cooling profile. So on a, a cold morning, you can tell it to heat up. Great. But it was really different. Different to most vehicles we looked at. The Wi-Fi connection wasn't to the internet and back to the car. The Wi-Fi connection was direct to the car. The Wi-Fi access point was on the vehicle itself. And that's really unusual. So in order to talk Wi-Fi, you need a Wi-Fi key. So in the manual for the vehicle comes the Wi-Fi network name and the Wi-Fi key. They can't be changed. They're on a piece of paper in the vehicle manual. And that got me really interested. So I looked at the syntax for the Wi-Fi key. And the Wi-Fi key itself is made up of four lowercase letters and six numbers. And that is way too short. That is not secure. We managed to crack that on a, a graphics processing rig. It took us two and a half days. Or you can go and buy an old Bitcoin mining rig. They're good for keys as well. Um, or if you want, you want to crack this key quickly, upload it to the cloud. And you can do cloud computation for about $1,000 to crack that key instantly. But you don't have to be by the car when you're doing the crack. Go find the car capture the key for over Wi-Fi, then you can go away and come back the following day, and we have cracked and now got that Wi-Fi network. So what do we do next? We've got the Wi-Fi key for the car. We've cracked it. So the next thing we do is we do what's called a man-in-the-middle attack, where we intercept and relay all the traffic. So we tell the car that we're the phone, and we tell the phone that we're the car, and we sit in the middle and listen to everything that's going on. And that's where the fun started. So the first thing we found is we used a good old hacking tool, a network sniffing tool called Wireshark. And that's it on the right there. And you can see lots of commands going to and from the car. So the red is the car, and the blue is the smartphone. Now, it was a binary protocol. It took some time to understand how it worked. But once we figured it out, we could see, ah, OK, so lights on command. So you send command 10 and giving it a parameter of one. So really easy to do. So hopefully this will work. I'll try and do it live. If you send those six um, hex commands, this happens. Hopefully the video will work. Yep. There you go. And now the lights are on. So we've connected to the car. We turn the lights on. So hey, that was a bit easy, though. Um, I wanted to go further. And this is where it gets relevant for all of you. Any smartphone application that you write, maybe to control a device, any smartphone app you buy to do things with, you can take them apart. The hacker can take apart the source code and understand how your application flows. It's easy to do. Android is easier than iOS. Um, all you have to do is connect to the phone, um, get the Android software development kit, and you can then start extracting the Android package files from the phone and then decompile and read them. And I've got some examples here. This is uh, one of the classes. So up on the top left there, hopefully, you'll see um, all the classes. And this is how the messages to the car are constructed. So I started investigating this, looked at the various commands you could send, and there I found that one at the top there, theft alarm. Ooh. Now, that could be interesting, couldn't it? Now, the first place we went is we looked at um, whether we could drain the battery. Could we tell the battery on the car to drain itself so when you go to drive in the morning, no charge? OK, well, we found we could do that by enabling the cooling. So you could have some fun here. On a cold day, you could go to someone's car and turn on the AC so it gets really, really cold, and they have no charge left in the battery either. But I wanted to go further. Now, this is a demo. I've recorded it for you. Two things to know. I've wound down the window here so I don't have to smash it. Okay? Otherwise, it's a very expensive demonstration. But you can see here, if I put my hand in, you can just see the turn signals at the front there. They are now flashing. Okay? So that's the alarm working correctly. If I send it seven hex octets, the alarm is disabled. So if we do this now, you watch there. The turn signals are no longer working, but even worse, I can reach inside, and I can open the door to the vehicle, because I'm doing it from the inside. Next thing I do, I go down to the diagnostics port, which is by your knee. I plug in a coding, uh, a coding kit. I code a key to the vehicle. I steal your car. That's a bit scary, isn't it? Just because the manufacturer wanted to use Wi-Fi. Now I'm on the diagnostics port. I'm also onto the car network. Now I can start playing around with the functions of the vehicle, so I could disable the brakes if they're fly-by-wire braking. 
I could mess around with the steering if you have self-park. I could cut virtually anything on that vehicle. Now, a lot of manufacturers of vehicles argue that the skills that we use to do this are difficult and complex. Yes, I agree. It took a lot of work to do this. However, once one person has done this, it's very easy to automate the process. So we wrote a script, which we haven't published, which you can run, type alarm off, and the alarm goes off. Criminals will invest time and money in this. Vehicles are expensive. Um, the other scary bit is because it uses Wi-Fi, I can track the vehicles. And there are all the Mitsubishi Outlanders in the UK. Really easy, hey? So I can go and find a vehicle using um, Google. I can then go and crack the Wi-Fi key. I can then go and disable the theft alarm and steal the vehicle. Crazy. Now, a really key point to bear in mind here is about the disclosure process. So when we found this bug, we wanted to tell Mitsubishi all about it. And we gave them the call, and we said, we found this bug, and we sent them all the details that we did. And they didn't return our call. So we rang them again, and they said, we've had no reports anywhere in the world. We don't think it's a problem. We're not going to do anything. What? So we're now stuck. So I asked the BBC to give Mitsubishi a call, and now Mitsubishi think it's a very serious problem, and they're fixing it. That's another story. So here's something for you. If you are producing some smart devices or thinking about a smart device for your home, make sure you publish a way for security researchers to contact you, whether it's security at email address. Researchers will contact you if you build smart devices. Engage them, talk to them, learn from them. It's really, really worthwhile. But it's not the only issue. We also reverse engineered the mobile application and found this function in it, change gun status. Hmm. I don't know, maybe is that a special James Bond version? I don't know. But the consequences are serious. I can take control of your vehicle, a connected car, and I can take control of it. That's really worrying. We also think about stealing the car. But sometimes there are place, things, places and things we can steal from the car. And I'll give you a good example. This is Tesla. I've got a lot of respect for Tesla. I think they're an awesome vehicle. Because if they make a mistake in their security, they have the ability to update the car remotely over the air. So they can push an update to fix a bug. That's great, really cool. But in order to do that, the vehicle needs to connect to your home wireless access point. And in order to do that, it needs your Wi-Fi key. So now the car is storing something really quite useful. It's got your keys. Brilliant. Now, Tesla, they're doing a great job. They've got a really good secure platform that does get hacked, but at least they can fix it, unlike many other car manufacturers. But there are other ways of making money out of smart vehicles. I'm going to take you on a little journey here. So first thing, has anyone had CryptoLocker, the encrypting malware? Anyone seen it? Yeah, one or two of you, OK. Now, imagine this is your computer at home, and you haven't backed up that computer recently. You've got some photographs of your family that are very, very precious to you. And then you get attacked by malware that locks your computer up. Would you pay the $100 they're asking to unlock your machine? I think you would, wouldn't you? You'd pay for that. This happens a lot. What about this, though? This is another example of the Internet of Things going crazy. It's a cold day. It's very cold out there. And you want to turn up your smart thermostat. So you've bought a smart thermostat so you can turn your heating on remotely so it's, the house will be nice and warm when you get home. One of these. What happens when you get back and you see this? And your smart thermostat has been ransomware. Now, this is the uh, thermostat we presented at uh, DEF CON in the summer. And we showed how you can take control of smart devices and hold them to ransom. How much would you pay? Your children are cold. You can't turn your heating on. What would you do? Have a think about that. But let's go one step further. How much would you pay if your car infotainment system suddenly locked up and told you you had to pay bitcoins to unlock it? How much would you pay for that? That's a bit scary. Bad day, you're in a hurry, and all of a sudden your car says, no, you're not going anywhere. I think we can do this. But even worse, what about if this becomes a systemic problem across the entire infrastructure? What if one model of vehicle, all of the vehicles suddenly locked up like this? I chose the Toyota Prius not because it's vulnerable, but because it's the ministerial car that um, in the UK our politicians use. 
What about every car in a fleet suddenly stops working? Or maybe people go, let's have an autonomous fire truck. What if that stopped working? What if all of the fire trucks stopped working? Because someone has made a mistake with the security and a hacker has taken control. That starts to get scary. And we also think and overlook the unintended consequences sometimes. Think about a vehicle immobilizer. We built immobilizers to stop the car being stolen, so they're easy to lock. Sorry, they're easy to enable, but they're not difficult to disable. So if I wanted to take control of your car, I could use the immobilizer, because we think about it being secure, not being used about against, against you. What about denial of service? In the last two weeks, we've seen the Internet of Things, so compromised CCTV cameras and digital video recorders, become a weapon against website, creating denial of service attacks. What if I could tell every smart vehicle of a particular brand to talk to your website at the same time? All of a sudden, your website falls over. Doesn't take much, does it? And then we do some crazy stuff. So then we go and do things on least cost. This is the code that runs inside this thermostat. The developer never gave any thought to someone reading their code. They wrote this. The unhandled SSL status, if it goes wrong, they called it the SSL shit status. They don't think anyone was going to see that, right? And then there's also a um, transition mode. So when the screensaver's on, it has blinds and wipes. And they have a fast blind mode that is called the son of a bitch mode. This developer who wrote the code for this never thought the hacker would have access to the firmware running on here. So some real simple advice. All of this can be fixed, but people don't think about it. So if I wanted to secure the software on here, I would encrypt it and then digitally sign it. And then every time I powered on the device, I would check that encryption signature and make sure it was my firmware, not something a hacker put on there. Then I'd go back to basics. I'd encrypt everything. I'd encrypt the communications we do over Wi-Fi. I'd encrypt the communications we do over GSM. I'd encrypt my mobile application. And I'd make sure that everything that I was doing was secure and encrypted and working well. There's some great advice out there. So if you're developing smartphone apps, if you're developing web applications, go to OWASP.org, the Open Web Application Security Project. Go and make sure whoever's developing your applications or your websites follows their advice. It's really, really good. So the conclusion of my talk is I'm not sure we're ready for autonomous vehicles yet. Not because we've got the functions. Every, yes, I think we can solve the issues around stopping vehicles, crashing, running over people. I think autonomous vehicles will be safer generally. But I don't think we've even now got the security of connected cars right. So I don't think we should be pushing autonomous vehicles into the market when we can't be absolutely certain about their security. Look, even Tesla, who are brilliant, even they made mistakes. So even guys who are really on it still make mistakes. And don't forget, cars have a long lifespan. They're out there for a long time, 10 plus years. Maybe the Tesla, you can fix it easily. You can do an update over the air. Most cars, you have to recall them and send them back for a service. I think adding autonomous and connected vehicles without getting the security absolutely right and being really, really sure is a very dangerous game to play. So I don't think, personally, we're ready quite yet. I know it's probably quite a different message to many of the other speakers here, but I think we need to urge caution. Yes, we can do cool stuff. We can make cars drive by themselves. But if we can't do it securely and be absolutely certain that vehicle isn't going to be taken over by a hacker, I think we need to keep carefully. Think very carefully. I blog about this every day. That's my Twitter handle. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.